Tonight on Global National, a gun you can print. There's no question this helps you evade a background check. Plastic and virtually undetectable, how do we keep them out of the wrong hands? Summer in the springtime, as the country sizzles, is there a downside? along from space. This Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield celebrates the power of music. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with an innovation in technology that is making the unthinkable possible. Three-dimensional printers, printers capable of producing physical objects, are now so advanced you can buy them for your home and create pretty well anything you want out of plastic, even a gun. That's what an American University student has done, and today he not only successfully fired that gun using real bullets, he posted the blueprints online. As Mike Drolet reports, it's a development one American senator calls stomach churning. It's called the Liberator, and save for the firing pin and bullet, it's all plastic. If you have an $800 3D printer at home, all you need to do is download the blueprints to make it. No serial number, untraceable, and yes, its designer is fully aware of the can of worms he's opened up. There's no question. This helps you evade a background check. Yeah, this is, makes it easier for you to get a gun. Up until now, Cody Wilson had only replicated parts of an AR-15, the gun used in the Newtown shooting. He put the blueprints online. To date, there have been over 800,000 downloads. What's coming out is a lower receiver of an AR-15. When Global 16x9 caught up with him last year, the self-described anarchist admitted he wanted to make a point against government control. For us, it's not a, we're not makers thinking, what's the best thing we can make? It's a political project. Well, politicians and police agencies have taken notice. The RCMP says it's monitoring the situation, as is the ATF in the U.S. And Senator Charles Schumer says lawmakers need to find a way to outlaw the technology. We're facing a situation where any felon, a terrorist, can open a gun factory in their garage and the weapons they make will be undetectable. It's stomach churning. I'd be more worried in Canada. The security experts suggest Ottawa needs to step up. While in the U.S. law enforcement agencies are used to guns, Canada is a different story. The implications of 3D guns, easily made, hard to detect, are endless. I would put this on the highest list of legislation for banning and I'd also be stepping up the security searching and making people more aware of this uh, this new 3D plastic gun that's available. Up until recently the idea of a plastic gun was science fiction. Now all you need is an internet connection and a specialized printer. Mike Trollet, Global News Toronto. So how are authorities in this country responding to 3D guns? Well, we tried to put the question to Vic Taves, the Minister of Public Safety. His office gave us the department's parliamentary secretary, who said the law in Canada will not change. It remains illegal to manufacture or own a firearm in this country without a license. It's new technology. It's something the RCMP are watching very closely. Uh, again, the safety of, of Canadians, making sure the guns don't get into the wrong hands, it, it's a priority. This certainly is technology to keep an eye on. 3D printers have been called the new industrial revolution. They become smaller and they've dropped in price since they were first developed just over a decade ago. The printers layer plastic to form three-dimensional objects. They can produce anything really from a pop culture sculpture to a complex gear mechanism. The technology has also been adapted for medical use. Bioprinting creates tissues with cells and current clinical trials are underway creating kidneys and other organs. Well, many Canadians spent the day basking in unseasonably warm weather. Records were smashed along the West Coast and the sunshine stretched right across the country. Edmonton earned the distinction of being today's hot spot. Nothing like summer in the springtime. But as Robin Gill reports, the sudden warmth does come at a cost. Vancouver is used to liquid sunshine. There was no sign of that today. 22 degrees at the beach, 30 inland. It's the perfect excuse to take a dip in the ocean. How was the water? Pleasing. What made you do it? I like it. 
or whip out that bikini and have a school day on the beach. This is our, uh, our classroom, yeah. Is this just an excuse to get outside? You betcha. Records are being broken right along the West Coast. In southern BC, looking back over the last 40 years, I haven't seen a long stretch of very warm, dry weather this early in May. All across Canada, the sun is shining on our nation. In Ottawa, the temperature hit 26 degrees. But with the warm weather comes danger. Fire season has hit Calgary. It's kind of alarming when, uh, when you wake up and look out your window and there's a fire. This is the first thing you can see. And then there's this a torrent of spring runoff. 13 communities in Saskatchewan have declared flood emergencies. There must be five feet of water on the driveway, and that's a rise of the water of the whole area that you see behind me. That whole area has risen more than five feet because the water was below the driveway before the melt started. In Toronto, the balmy conditions are keeping Leafs fans positive. This is amazing. I will be watching the game in my backyard tonight. It's going to be awesome. It's nice to watch a Leaf game while it's nice and warm out. But because it was cold for so long, the sudden burst of summer has produced both tree and grass pollen, making for a more severe allergy season. You're really getting a double whammy of both pollens in the air now at the same time, whereas typically you'd have a bit of a break from one to the next. Still, you won't hear many complaints from Canadians who couldn't wait for this. I'm loving it. Thanks. I'm going to be here all day. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. People in Nova Scotia are in mourning tonight after a young Cape Breton woman died near the end of the Toronto Marathon. 18-year-old Emma Van Nostrand was attempting her first marathon. She collapsed just three kilometers from the finish line. The ex exact cause of her death isn't known yet. She's from a family full of runners and had run several half marathons. Last month, she was in Boston, cheering on her father in that race. And another tragic death to tell you about tonight. This one near Edmonton. A skydiving instructor died over the weekend. 49-year-old John Scott was on his fourth jump of the day. Witnesses say it all went smoothly until the very end when he hit the ground too fast. Scott was an instructor at an Edmonton area parachute school. He'd skydived around the world and he trained in the Canadian Forces parachute team, the Skyhawks. Very well qualified, always well researched and understood what he was doing. He was just a solid man. His death is a big blow to the tight-knit skydiving community. Well, those attack ads the federal conservatives have been running targeting Justin Trudeau may not be having their desired effect. A new Ipsos poll for Global News and Post Media shows the ads may, in fact, be bolstering support for Trudeau and the Liberals. Shirley Engel looks at why Canadians don't appear to be into going negative. He was born with a famous name, but does he have the judgment to be Prime Minister? Barely a day into his new job, the first attacks against Justin Trudeau. But the Tory ads may be backfiring. A new poll suggests among Canadians who have seen the ads, support for the Liberals has actually jumped nine points above the Tories, while the NDP is trailing. What's more, among those who have seen the ads, 38% say they're more likely to vote Liberal, compared with 13% for the Conservatives. The short-term effect has been to move soft NDP over to Justin Trudeau out of sympathy. After years of struggling to fill their coffers, the Liberals are now boasting their new fortunes. Since I became leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, we've raised over a million dollars. A casually dressed Trudeau on YouTube thanking over 14,000 Canadians who have donated to the party, nearly half for the first time. I think they're going to have to uh, rethink uh, the approach that they're taking. Uh, it, uh, it is not working, and, uh, and I think that uh, they're beginning to realize that. Why is Michael Ignatieff back in Canada? After his devastating defeat in the last election, former Liberal leader Michael Ignatieff admitted Tory attack ads were a factor. So why not now? For one thing, the Liberals never countered those ads against Ignatieff. In the past, I think the tone has been more policy-based. I think the thing that was different with these Justin Trudeau ads is they were pretty um, condescending and dismissive and in a way that I think Canadians don't really like. The Tories have seen some backlash in their own party with some MPs refusing to take part in mass mail attacks against Trudeau. Still, the government is staying on message. Well, we know that Canadians do care about having a Prime Minister who is experienced, who understands the economy and has a track record of delivering results on lower taxes and job creation. Stephen Harper has that. Justin Trudeau doesn't. Some observers say the ads may still benefit the Tories in the long run. 
by planting a seed that may just bloom in time for the next election. Donna? Okay, Shirley Engel in Ottawa, thank you. A New Brunswick farmer who spent a year in a Beirut jail accused of shipping rotten potatoes to Algeria is now suing the Canadian government. Hank Tepper says his charter rights weren't protected because the government blatantly disregarded requests for assistance while he was in prison. The multi-million dollar lawsuit also claims the RCMP provided misinformation to Algerian authorities. There has been a dramatic turn in the bloody war in Syria. Israeli warplanes have hit targets inside that country, and today the White House said Israel has the right to defend itself. It's believed the target was Iranian missiles bound for Hezbollah, the Lebanese-based terror group that threatens Israel. As Eric Sorensen reports, it could have implications for the way Washington responds to the Syrian conflict. Israel has moved its Iron Dome missile defense weapons near the Syrian border, as close as Israel will come to officially admitting it launched these airstrikes into Syria on the weekend. The bombing struck several locations. The main target, missiles believed to be from Iran being transported to Hezbollah in Lebanon, missiles that could strike deeply and accurately into Israel. They have the right to act in their own sovereign interest. Without acknowledging Israel launched the attacks, Washington backs Israel's actions. Israel certainly has uh, the right uh, to uh, be concerned about the transfer of sophisticated weapons to Hezbollah. In Syria today, anger, but no immediate moves to retaliate. A muted response from Iran as well, though there were angry demonstrations. We are here to protest against Israel, says this Syrian student, for invading Syrian soil. The attacks are a calculated risk by Israel. Syria's civil war has made the country on Israel's doorstep unstable. But the regime of Bashar al-Assad, already under siege, appears to be in no position to confront Israel in a war. Assad is busy with his survival. He has no time, nor even the, the I think, even the, the, the thinking, the thought of, uh, of t taking care of Israel. Neither the Israeli attack nor the recent evidence of chemical weapons use in Syria has been enough to trigger a wider conflict yet. But there is growing pressure on the U.S. to get off the sidelines. We eventually will use some kind of airstrikes limited to protect uh, some of the rebel fortresses, but also possibly to go after some of those chemical sites. Secretary of State John Kerry is on his way to Moscow. A key turning point would be getting Russia on side for intervention in Syria. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Washington. Still ahead, a bridal party tragedy. The driver of a limo that went up in flames talks about the trauma of what happened that night. We're back in a moment. One of the three young men accused of interfering in the Boston Marathon bombing investigation was released today. 19-year-old Robel Filipos was freed on a $100,000 bond and under strict conditions. He's charged with lying to U.S. federal authorities about visiting Johar Sarnayev's dorm room hours after the FBI released a picture of the suspected bomber. One of the most high-profile neo-Nazi murder trials opened in Munich, Germany today. The surviving members of the so-called Nazi underground are accused of killing 10 people in racially motivated attacks. As Stuart Greer reports, the trial comes amid growing concerns about far-right extremists in economically battered Europe. As the accused were whisked inside a Munich courthouse, dozens of protesters from Germany's Turkish minority clashed with police outside. Stop! They're outraged it has taken more than five years for this trial to begin. And they say for too long, authorities turned a blind eye to the country's deadliest neo-Nazi group. 38-year-old Beate Shepe is one of the last surviving members of a far-right cell called the Nazi Underground, or NSU. She, along with four accomplices, are accused of carrying out a seven-year killing spree aimed at spreading terror among immigrants so they would leave Germany. Almost all of the ten victims were minorities, eight of them Turkish and one Greek. The alleged Nazi terror ring is also accused of at least two car bombings. The NSU often... When the NSU was revealed, it was a shock, said the lawyer for one of the victims' families. But now there's finally a face to this phantom. 
Many in Germany are asking how police could have overlooked the neo-Nazi group. For years, authorities suspected the killings were linked to the Turkish mafia. That and the mysterious destruction of key evidence have fueled suspicion and outrage. The sensational trial in Germany comes as neo-Nazi groups in other parts of Europe attempt to capitalize on a half a decade of economic turmoil and rising unemployment. A thousand black-shirted members of the far-right Hungarian Jobbik party protested this weekend against the World Jewish Congress meeting in Budapest. Israelis should go somewhere else, warned its leader, because Hungary is not for sale. The Hungarian prime minister denounced the rally, but nothing was done to stop it or ban the party. We've met many times with uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban. He promised a lot, delivered nothing. Back in Munich at the Beate Shepi hearing, the court was adjourned after the defense team complained about being searched for weapons. The trial will resume next week and is expected to last a year. Stuber Greer, Global News, Prague. In California, investigators are trying to determine the cause of a horrific limousine fire that killed a young bride and four of her friends. Today, the shaken limo driver spoke out, saying he wished he could have done more that night, but it all happened so fast. Christina Stevens has more details on how a post-wedding party went so horribly wrong. Cell phone video shows flames shooting from the limousine, where five women died after being trapped inside. Four others barely managed to escape the inferno. The limo driver says as he crossed the San Francisco area bridge, he heard one of the women knocking on the partition saying smoke. At first he thought they wanted to pull over for a cigarette. She said, no, smoke, 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 pull over. And I'm looking and I see the grief on her face. Okay, I can see that, you know, it's actually smoke and I see the smoke coming through and I'm panicking, they're panicking. And I finally pull over. He helped four women through the partition and two motorists tried but couldn't free the others. It was horrific. The car was engulfed, you know, completely engulfed. And I felt that nobody could, could have survived that. You know, the flames were too high. It happened so fast. The woman who shot the cell phone video says she could feel the heat from two lanes away. I was like, oh my gosh. There is one car, maybe there is people there. And then when we get closer, there, I saw people crying there. The Lincoln Town car was packed with women celebrating a girls' night out with a newlywed bride. The bride, 31-year-old Nariza Fojas, was among the dead. Just recently married, she was planning on traveling to her native Philippines for a ceremony with family. I reach out to the families. I I really feel for him. I wish that we could have done something different, you know, to save him. The five dead were found huddled near the partition. Two of the four surviving women remain in critical condition. Officials say the vehicle was only licensed for eight passengers, and there were nine. The cause of the fire is still under investigation. Christina Stevens, Global News. When we come back, the Dutch slurge on a plan to clean up Amsterdam's racy reputation. Our tourists paying attention. We start in the busy newsroom. Things are moving fast. Cut the corner office. Big idea guy says news consumption is changing. Busy people. He's getting his news. Yep, her too. This guy's uh back to corner office. Big idea guy says we need a news platform that works on every device. Build a new website. Add award-winning journalists. Now show people where to find it. The redesigned globalnews.ca. Real-time reporting, original content, any device. Well, Amsterdam is one of those European cities on many tourists' must-see lists. For some, it's to take in the amazing art galleries and the beautiful canals. For others, there are less family-friendly attractions, the brothels and the cannabis cafes. Some of those racy pursuits may become a thing of the past because, as Sean Ballin reports, Amsterdam is trying to clean up its reputation. A Dutch national treasure goes back on display. This self-portrait of Vincent van Gogh is among the priceless collection in the museum that bears his name, newly reopened after a multi-million dollar facelift. It's an extremely exciting time. All the institutions around us have invested huge amounts of money. The nearby Rijksmuseum just completed a massive 10-year refurbishment, and the Stedelijk has a vast new white and glass extension for its modern art. 
the Dutch have splurged more than a billion dollars for their homes of high culture. Yeah, the city is certainly changing, and I think um, there's there are lots of efforts to make the city attractive. Of course, people come to Amsterdam not only for the Van Goghs and the Rembrandts and the great museums, they come for the prostitutes and the pot in the red light district. That part of the city is also undergoing a transformation, and not everyone approves. Project 1012, named after the postal code for the district, proposes to close almost half of Amsterdam's window front brothels. The famously tolerant Dutch say they need to crack down because organized crime has been taking over. It's a safety issue, it's a vision issue. We think that the uh, inner historical city center has to be uh, very open and accessible for everybody. It's not my name, it's them. Metje Black worked as a prostitute for 25 years before turning to filmmaking. She says closing the legal brothels will push women onto the street or into unregulated operations. Not safe. It, it's safer to be in the windows. Yes. In the windows working, it's just open. You can see them. You can see your clients. You can see everything. Also targeted by Project 1012, the famous coffee houses. Almost half are to lose their licenses to sell cannabis. I think it's uh, unfair. It's one of the main reasons why Amsterdam enjoys more tourists than, uh, than it could possibly expect on account of its few museums. When the Van Gogh Museum reopened, the lineup stretched down the block. But the red light district was also typically crowded. Amsterdam hopes to shift the balance from the profane more towards the sublime. Sean Mellon, Global News, Amsterdam. Coming up, there's music in the air. Canadian students liven up this Monday with an extra special sing-along from space. That's next. Just a spin in the Global National. More trouble for Justin Bieber. An overexcited fan rushed the stage at his concert in Dubai. Bieber shrugged off the incident and did manage to finish the show. The only casualty was that piano that got knocked over in the scuffle. Well, another Canadian took the stage today for a musical performance, one that was quite literally out of this world. Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield held a sing-along from space, strumming his guitar, while about a million schoolchildren across the country sang along. Hadfield says music has inspired him, and as Mike Armstrong reports, he wants to share his passion. I'll show you where I sleep. As ambassadors go, Chris Hadfield is prolific, whether talking about sleep in his PJs or being sick in a bag. Quick, you get your barf bag open. Or eating floating chocolate cake. It'd be messy. Hadfield has tried to show life in space and life from space. His photos of Earth have been seen by millions. Well, Hadfield didn't focus on space today, but he used it. Everybody set? To pass on another passion, music. One, two, three, four. Live from the International Space Station, Hadfield led students on Earth in song. Now, this wasn't just this classroom in Montreal or the Science Centre in Vancouver. This was an estimated one million Canadian students from coast to coast. The sing-along was Music Monday, put on by the Coalition for Music Education. It's an annual event, but they don't usually have an astronaut. On a scale from 1 to 10, I was like 10, per, like 10 on 10 excited for this. I wish I could do the exact same thing. Someday? Yeah. Just a man up in space singing with us is just mind-blowing. Hatfield, from the most technologically advanced perch possible, was preaching about something, well, elementary. Music, and how he says it has always tapped into the human soul. Some of the oldest relics we found of human invention, way back uh, when people lived in caves, were of musical instruments. It's ancient and necessary to humanity. Hadfield left students with memories and more than a few smiles, finishing off with a little twirl other musicians can only dream of. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. Wow, they'll never forget that. And that is Global National for this Monday. Tonight's Your Canada is Aurelia, Ontario. You can send us your photos of Your Canada through our website, globalnews.ca. I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.